morning and welcome to the CSS News. Uh, my name is Becky Sawyer. I'm actually the collections manager down at Fort Fisher State Historic Site. And in honor of Women's History Month, I'm talking about Martha Coston and her invention of the Coston flare rockets, which were widely used um, during the Civil War and particularly at Fort Fisher. So we're going to get started. And thank you for coming out today. So. Martha Jane Hunt was born in Baltimore, Maryland on December 12, 1826, and moved to Philadelphia with her widowed mother, brothers, and sisters sometime during her childhood in the 1830s. Um, in the 1840s, she married Benjamin Franklin Coston, who was a promising young inventor and who was a sailing master in the U.S. Navy. Um, he had come up with some prototypes for a submarine that could be navigated for eight hours underwater. Um, when they met, um, they moved to Washington, D.C., um, where he oversaw the Naval Laboratory at the Washington Navy Yard. Um, now, Coston had a, a bright career. He had come up with the idea for the Coston rockets originally as well as other inventions such as percussion caps, rockets, percussion primers for cannons, and the lanyard lock that was used by Dahlgren on all of his guns. Um, Coston had created some inventions such as the gas light for the Christiana Lighthouse up in Delaware in the mid-1840s, and he had also developed various rockets and pyrotechnics. He resigned from the Navy due to a conflict in pay and promotion um, so he left and started a company up in Boston that produced gas lights for outdoors. Due to constant exposure from various toxic chemicals, Coston died in 1848 at the age of 27, which left Martha a widow with four young children. While going through some of her husband's letters and packets, she found evidence of the Coston of Coston working on flares for signaling at night. The testing period for her life consumed nearly 10 years and through experimentation to perfect the recipe for a flare that burned red, white, and blue. Coston's reference to the men that she employed and the experiments that she made herself and the frauds practiced upon her represent some of the most trying obstacles because she did not possess the knowledge of chemistry or scientific experimentation or methodology or understanding of business, she had to rely on others that did have the knowledge, of whom were all men. Based on gender alone, she felt ignored and not taken seriously and sometimes deceived. But she persevered and treasuring the support that she did have, she finally experienced a breakthrough while watching the New York celebration of laying the first transatlantic cable in 1858. After viewing some spectacular fireworks, she began corresponding with several New York pyrotechnics in hope of getting a strong blue as the third color to be used in the red and white that she had already developed. She cor corresponded under a man's name, um, fearing that she would not be taken seriously because she was a woman. And one man did reply that he had made a blue color some years previous Coston urged him to duplicate the blue. If not, she'd be interested in strong green. Within 10 days, she received a packet containing a strong green color, and in the end, for the patriotic red, white, and blue, she had to settle for red, white, and green um, with the clarity of the green and brilliance of the green. So Coston immediately entered negotiations to work with this New York pyrotechnic, and on April 5th, 1859, and number 23,506, the cost and signal flare was approved. And this is the um, <clears throat> patent record that you look up at the patent office up in Washington, D.C. Um, what's interesting is that it still has her husband's name on it because he was the creator, you know, the original researcher and founder for the cost and rocket. So his name is on this patent record. Um, but what's interesting, it has it as the red, white, and blue, not the red, white, and green. Um, and actually, the numbers and the sequence does change um, from this origin, original pattern. Uh, originally has one is white, two is red, three is blue, 
four is white, red, five is white, blue, six is red, white, and then goes red, blue, and then blue, white, blue, red, and then white, red, blue, and then red and white. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about this. So this is the official um, Cox and Knight signet. So you can see um, it's kind of like an Morse code. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. P is for um, promontory and A is for answer. So if you were to send up a flare, you would do the P, so white, red, white, do your code, and then you'd conclude it with an answer. So red, white, red. So this is just giving you an idea of And this is the rocket pistol that would fire the Coston signal flare. It is a simple pistol that you would insert the flare into the muzzle. Aha. So you'd insert the, the flare into here. And then a percussion cap would go up here. You'd cock this back, use this to fire, and this would to eject the, the cartridge. Um, and these are what the flares would look like. So this is red, so this is number four. This is green white, so this is number eight. This would be white red, so that's number two. And the white one is number one. So each flare was a hollow cylindrical shaped, the three inch long wooden stem device that is filled with gunpowder or a powder composition and sealed with a paper top. <clears throat> when the costume signals were approved by use by the U.S. Navy, almost 300 sets of costume signals had been purchased by the U.S. Navy and distributed to all the U.S. squadrons around the world. The North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, which would have been off North Carolina's coast, used these extensively and for the first time they were used in the rescue of the USS Monitor off of Cape Hatteras, December 30th, 1862. So on the evening of um, December 30th, um, the monitor, which is seen right here, um, was starting to take on water. And due to the crew, they sent up an emergency signal to the USS Rhode Island, which was towing it. And because of using the flare, they rescued 26 men off of the USS monitor. Now, not only did the U.S. Navy use the cost and night signals, but so did the Army. And this is their example of what the cost and signals would look like. And it's a little bit different. Um, the numbers are different color-wise. And they have the promontory, you know, basically sending up, get ready for, this, you know, for your message. That's the answer, um, your number. I don't know what the blue is, but this is a different system of night signals that were used by the U.S. Army, but it just gives you an idea of how it would be set up. Due to their popularity in Europe and other parts of the world, fireworks did not become popular in the United States until the mid-19th century, until the 1860s. Um, J.A. Lindenthal was the owner of a fireworks manufacturing company in New York City, and Lindenthal was considered one of the first skilled pyrotechnics in the United States. Um, Lindenthal held the production rights to make the small signaling flares called the Costin Composition Night Signals, aka the Costin Telegraphic Night Signals. And seen here, these boxes would hold up to 98 flares. So it's showing you how they would have them divided up by the colors and so forth. And they would be in a wooden box um, that would have a false bottom to it um, and waterproof and all that stuff. So that you, you wanted to keep these watertight. You didn't want water getting into these flares. Let's see if I can do this.
I was trying to, there's a, I was trying to get something to work where it would show you the flares going up at night. Um, that's a good idea because you have a sequence of going, them going up. Um, but it's not working for me, unfortunately. Um, I was hoping it would work. Um, now during the battles of Fort Fisher, um, December 24th through the 26th, 1864, and January 13th through the 15th, 1865, Hoston signals were used extensively by the Navy at night to communicate with each other. So from the deck logs of the USS Mackinac on December 24th, it lists Hoston signals being used on the early morning of December 24th. The flagship signaled green, red, which is number nine, then red is four, white is one, White green is three, red green is six. And then they answered with red, white, red. So they had received the answer. Um, what's interesting is that a little bit further up, this is at about two in the morning, they are receiving these signals. Um, and right before this is when the gunboat USS Louisiana was loaded up with powder to quote, blow up the fort. And it, they talk about that and they seen an explosion um, right before they start signaling um, to the fleet. So but it just shows you that they're signaling, not only with cost and signals, but with also signal flags as well. And from a letter from a clerk, um, Stockbridge, he was a clerk on the um, USS Patuxent, he writes home a little bit and he mentions the using Hoston rockets, but January 13th, like the moon shining on a frosted window, window, the ships rolled just enough to move the lights, which looked like a thousand stars running around each other. Now and then you can see a flash and hear a heavy booming of the 15 inch guns on the ironclads. Looking over the starboard bow, you can see the Admiral making signals. Red, white, red, answer green, red. I can't seem to realize how and what it is so strange. It seems to be if I was in some fairy land. We are one day behind, so I don't know where we are in the success of what we have not. Know that the troops are all landed. You can see the transport steaming out of sight, range of the forts. Can hear a shell explode on the rebel works from the monitors, lights up enough for an instant to see the dim outline of the forts. So again, they're even in personal letters, they mentioned the cost and flare rock rocker. Um, and this is showing one of the monitors off Fort Fisher and the other ships right behind it off Fort Fisher. So that's the Brooklyn, the Ironside, the Juanita, the Taconi, and the Yankee. And that's the monodoc in front. Now this is showing you the position of the fleet attacking Fort Fisher. And the most significant use of the costume rockets in the read about it and in history is the use during the battles of Fort Fisher. And General Order Number 78, issued by Rear Admiral David D. Porter on January 2nd, 1865 maps out the strategic movement of the Navy vessels for the bombardment of Fort Fisher, giving specific orders as to the formation of the first and second lines of battle. So the first line of battle is up here, second line's right here, third is down here. And then these are all in reserve. Um, a combination of different types of signals were used, primarily flags, whistles, and costume flares. And the ship logs of the leading three vessels in the line Battle line number two, the Minnesota, Colorado, and Wabash. So they're going to be right in here. They're going to be the second line right in here. Um, they mention in their deck logs about the Admiral using costume flares. And quote, at 4.30 a.m., Admiral made general signal 7218 by costume lights. At 5 a.m., we got underway and formed the line of battle standing in shore. At 6.40, flagship made general signals 757-1281, and we went to quarters at seven. 
The logs of all three ships detail the calculated movement and progress of the battles and the orchestration of organizing and moving numerous vessels. There's 58 warships off the coast of Fort Fisher. Um, and so by using these cost and signals, that's how they're able to get everybody into position. Um, and relying heavily on the cost and signals at night when the air became filled with heavy, dark smoke and the height of the firing, after three days of the bombardment, Fort Fisher fell on January 15, 1865. And this is from the deck logs of the USS Mackinac on January 15, and they list that they had expended two rockets and six costume flares. And they also mention in here that they had expended 363 nine inch shells and 363 10 pound charges. So they're just, they're also listening, listing uh, what ammunition they had expended as well. But that's just giving you an idea of just one vessel during, on one day. While writing her autobiography many years later, Costum received a letter from Admiral B. Porter, commanding officer of Fort Fisher attack, detailing the role of the Costum signals played in the Battle of Fort Fisher. And reference to Fort Fisher in concluding paragraph of his letter, he wrote, I shall never forget the beautiful sight presented at 10 o'clock at, at night when Fort Fisher fell. I was determined to be a little extravagant on that occasion and telegraphed by signals to all creation that the great fort had fallen and that the last entrance to the southern coast was closed. The order was given to send up rockets without stint and to burn cost and signals at all yard arms, mastheads, and along the bulwarks, and wherever a shipboard could light could show. The sea and shore was illuminated with a splendor self seldom equal. What could be there be more beautiful than the cost and signals on that occasion? And what more could I say of them? Yours truly, respectfully, David B. Porter, Admiral of the U.S. Navy. So this is an illustration um, printed in the newspapers, I think February or March of 1865, and this is showing all the cost and rockets going up um, over the fleet when Fort Fisher had fallen. Now, after the Civil War, uh, Martha Costum actually was, uh, had to go to terms with the U.S. Navy and with Congress for payment for the Costum rockets used during the Civil War. And so she finally got back payment on the Costum rockets. And in 1871, she had repatented the Costum flares in her name only, uh, pad number, 1,115,835. And so her name, her husband's name was not on this pen like the previous 18 and 1859. Um, the cost and flares were used in the, into the late 19th century by the U.S. Weather Service, by the U.S. Coast Guard and life saving stations, and in countries all over the world, such as Brazil, England, Holland, Italy, and others. Also commercial, Merchant vessels and private yachting clubs up and down the East Coast used them as well. And they actually had their own, these yachting clubs had their own signals um, made up for their yachting club. Um, so, cost and signals continue to be the prime method of night signaling among ships until, until the development of the marine radios in the 1930s. Martha Costin dies on July 9th, 1904. She is buried in Philadelphia next to her beloved husband and two of her children who she lost in childhood. Um, the Costin um, Marine Signals, or this company, continued on almost into the 1980s, from what I was able to find out. And this is showing you some of the later um, advertisements for the Costin Marine Signals and so forth. So it's a little bit different than the Civil War, um, but it's still showing you that they are using them. And that is it. I thank you for coming out thank and you. learning about Martha Costin and the signal players. Are there any questions? <laughs>